Well, welcome back to James Wise Up from the archives. Myself and former pastor at Anthony Evangelical Church, Matt Bounds, working our way through the epistle of James, and it is the final stretch, people. Today is our ninth instalment of 11. We cross over from chapter 4 this week into chapter 5, and it's serious stuff. Uh, this week we're starting to think about the end, not of James's letter, but the end of this age, the dawning, the beginning of the next age, the age to come and Jesus' return. So um, <laughs> I hope you're ready for that. Uh, it's good fun, and I hope it isn't just fear-mongering, I hope it isn't just speculation, but I hope that it is fuel to live for Christ where we are, when we are, until he returns. God bless you. Right then, where are we? Uh, James, the book of James, wise up, looking at wisdom, um, the truth about Jesus, the world and us, put into practice. And last week, if you recall, we were um, looking at war. We were looking at three kinds of wars, actually. The wars that happen between one another, the fighting, the feuding, the quarreling. We looked at the war within ourselves, the, the desires that James said, war and fight and quarrel within us. And undergirding all of that, we were looking at the ultimate war, the war between ourselves and God. We learned, I hope we learned anyway, um, that in order to sort out all of those wars, the war within, the war without, the war between us and God, we need to sort out that most fundamental war, the war between us and our Creator. We learned that that hostility exists because we are a rebellious people. Our Creator God can only be sorted out with us when through repentance and through faith we trust in Jesus, and we put him back, if you remember what we were speaking about last week, at the center of the universe, at the center of all of our universes. And it's in this context, this call from James to reorientate ourselves, you like, of, of, of Christ taking that place of highest honor, that place of centrality in our lives, that James writes three passages. We're going to be looking at three distinct passages this morning, and I hope they kind of tie together. Uh, chapters 4 verses 13 to 17, chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, and chapter 5, verses 7 to 12. And then he, he's kind of addressing a different group or a different set of people who need different kind of advice, different people who disbelieve different things about God. They doubt the truth about Jesus, the world, and us. And for each one, really, he's encouraging them, just as he's been throughout the rest of the book, to see the truth, to see the truth of Jesus at the center, and to live it out. He's asking them to be wise, isn't it? He's asking them to be wise. Recognize the truth about Jesus and to live that truth out. So if you've got your Bibles, chapter 4, we'll start off with chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, 13 to the end of the chapter. This is what he says to the first group. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. As it is, you boast and brag, and all such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. This is the first group of people we're going to be meeting this morning. And if I could sum up their disbelief, I would sum it up like this. I don't believe, they say, that Jesus is in charge. I don't believe that Jesus is in charge. This group of people, if you look at what he says about them, they're happy for God to be ruling over heaven, but they themselves want to be ruling over earth. What do I mean by that? They're happy to look to God for salvation and to be in charge when we get there. But here and now, Today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives, they want to be in charge. They're actually people who haven't done what James has been suggesting in the first half of the chapter. Their lives, at least here on earth, are still very much centered around them. It's still them in the driving seat. And on the face of it, it might seem like a, a rather odd thing to pick people up on. Listen now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or to that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money 
I mean, what, what is it that James is, is reacting against? It, it could sound a little bit like he's reacting against and telling them not to make plans, not to plan for the future. But that can't be right, can it? We know elsewhere in Scripture that we're encouraged to be orderly, to be planning. Paul, for example, when he's speaking to the Corinthian church about laying aside money at the start of the month to, to help those who are in need, is suggesting can, some kind of order, some thought, some, some planning. He writes in his uh, epistles about planning to go on a journey here, planning to go on a journey there, when I come to meet you, when this has happened. You know, there's, there's planning ahead, there's looking forward. I think one of the best examples of this, where the, the Bible encourages and actually shows how planning is, is a good thing, is in the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph all the way back in Genesis. You remember his story? He was mistreated by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. He was uh, accused and sent to jail and this, that, and the other. And actually, the end of the story is him being the prime minister of Egypt, ruling the whole land. But more than that, in the story, Joseph is the one who plans ahead. There's a famine come in, and he encourages the people to store up a certain amount of their food so that when the famine comes, they'll not only have enough for themselves, but they'll be able to save his family who come looking for food, and he'll be able to be reconciled with his family. Planning in itself isn't wrong. Planning without God in mind, however, that's what James is after here, isn't it? It's planning as if we're in control, we're in charge, and God hasn't got a say about it. If you let me paraphrase, what he's basically saying is this. Instead of saying, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, you just watch me, I'm going to do everything, he encourages them to say, yeah, I'm going to do it, if God wills, if God allows. It's, It's just a subtle difference, isn't it? He doesn't tell them not to plan. He says there, verse 15, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this and do that. His encouragement isn't against planning, but is planning with God in mind. It's remembering who's in charge, whose directives, whose orders we're supposed to follow, and ultimately who says whether our plans are a yes or a no. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and we will do this or that. Plans still remain, but verse 13, it's I'll do. Verse 15, it's if God wills. There's a subtle but important shift because one attitude is saying that I'm the center, I'm in control, and the other is saying that God is in charge. And the gospel truth that he's telling them here to put into practice is that the same Jesus who came, who lived, who died to redeem is the one who is seated and who is reigning and ruling and holding all of our lives and all of our actions in our hands. Sometimes we can think that Jesus has done his job and now he's gone away. He's done his job and now he's gone away. But that's not that's not the whole story, is it? And I've said it before, I'll say it again. A half-truth about God is actually a lie. When we get part of the picture but we neglect the rest of it, we 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 end up in trouble. We end up um, with falsehoods. And to think that Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again, and that's it. It's not the full picture. I think that's why the... um, uh, author of Luke, Luke and the book of Acts mentions and focuses on the ascension so much because it's important for us as Christians to realize that Jesus hasn't simply gone away, but he's gone away to a very specific place, to heaven, to that seat of majesty, that seat of glory, that seat of authority and power and control. He's in charge. He's at the center of the universe from his throne even today and tomorrow and indeed for the rest of our lives. So the question is then, if that's all true, if that's all true, that's well and good, how do we know God's will for our lives? Because we often speak about it in those terms, don't we? I've spoken about it this morning in those terms when I've been speaking about Matt and praying about Matt. God, show us your will in this situation. As if the only way we can know God's will for our lives, we can only, the only way we can know what to plan today and tomorrow is through some kind of prophetic encounter with God. We think to know God's will for our lives is to know where we should live, where we should work, who we should marry, how many kids, you know, those kind of big things. That's God's will for my life. That's what I've got to find out. It doesn't say it in the Bible, so I've got to have some kind of experience to know God's will for my life. Then I can make plans. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to rubbish that. I'm not going to say that that isn't true. I think for many of us, we, we do know God's will for our lives in a particular way. Um, But I'm going to suggest, actually, that what James is speaking about here 
It's a different kind of will for our lives that we can all, all know and understand. Verse 16 and 17, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. 17, if anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now he's suggesting there, isn't he, that the people he's writing to know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. They know exactly what will, God's will is for their lives. They know the will of God and they've got this chance then to reject it. They know the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it. That is sin for them. You see, we know God's will for our lives, not because there are specific prophecies or words and things like that for us. And I'm not knocking that. But because God has spoken to us through his word. God has spoken to us through his word. He has revealed to us how he wants all of us to live. He's revealed to us his will, and that is to be obedient to his commands, be obedient to his scripture. Sometimes we want this voice to boom down from us from heaven, and we forget the fact that it already has. Do we need a supernatural experience to tell us what God's will for our lives is? I would say, yes, indeed we do. But the problem is we miss that when we open our Bibles, that is a supernatural experience. That is the living God, the one who is ruling, the one who is reigning, the one who is above all things, speaking to us. The scripture, God's word, the Bible. If we want to know what God wants us to do, if we want to factor him into our plans as we plan for tomorrow and the day after and the rest of our lives, we've just got to read what he's written, even in the book of James. Think about it. James has been telling these people lots of good things that they should do, hasn't he? We're four chapters into now him being very practical, him giving very clear instructions about how they should live their lives. He's encouraging people to love one another, to be generous to one another, to care for one another, to speak kindly to one another, to forgive one another, to put Jesus first. What's God's will for your life? It's all of those things and so much more. And we don't do it. And James is saying, look, you make plans for the future. You think about where you're going, what you're going to do, but you're not listening to God. You're ignoring God, his revealed will in his word. And that, he says, is a sin. It's evil. Rather than listening to God, you and I, if we're honest, most of the time, we live however we want. We listen to ourselves. We put ourselves back at the center of the universe. We don't believe Jesus is in charge. We exclude God from the future, and it shouldn't be. So to group one, that group that he's saying, I don't believe he's in charge, James says, oh, listen, listen, would you? He's spoken, and you better had listen. Remember God, follow his will, live today and tomorrow and the next day, and the knowledge that he's at the center, he's in control, and he's in charge. That's his command. Just, just listen. Listen to what God has got to say. We're going to have to move quickly through these because there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff to cover. So that's group one. I'm going to hopefully tie them all together at the end. Where does he go from there? Unsurprisingly, he goes to group two. Um, so let's have a look. Chapter five, verses one to six, and what he has to say there. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered innocent men who were not even opposing you. It's a bit full on, isn't it? How do we sum up then what's going on here? How do we sum up this second disbelief that these uh, group two have? I'd put it like this. These people are saying, I don't believe he's going to do anything. I don't believe he's going to do anything. I don't believe there's going to be a judgment. I don't believe he cares about the things that I do now. What do I mean by that? Well, just just look. Look at how they're behaving. They're accumulating wealth. Um, and he's not saying wealth in this, of itself is wrong. We've seen that in the book of James and the rest of scripture. But he has these words of luxurious, extravagant lifestyles that they're chasing after. And what he's really speaking out against is how they get there. How they get there. 
and the motives of their heart when they're there. They get this lifestyle, this way of living by treating others, especially those people who are weak, especially those people who are vulnerable, especially those people who are under their employment and their authority by mistreating them. See, they evidence the fact that they don't think Jesus is going to do anything, that there isn't any judgment, that there'll be no kind of, uh, you know, righting wrongs by the fact that they just carry on with it. They just carry on with it regardless. They chase after all the things that they think they can get in this world, regardless of what effect it has on other people. And so they're saying by their actions, you're not going to do anything about it. He's not going to do a thing. Group one is saying, I don't think he's in charge. These people, a subtle difference is saying, I don't, even if he is in charge, he's not bothered and he's not going to do anything. There'll be no judgment. But it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, just read those opening words. Weep and wail. Misery is coming for you. Why? Because not only is Jesus in charge, but he's the judge. That's exactly what he said in chapter 4, verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. That's a, that's a gospel truth that we need to, to realize, that we need to recognize, that we need to, to, to live out. Jesus is in charge, and at some point, Jesus has come back, and he's going to judge. And those who don't listen, especially this area, says James, are going to come unstuck terribly so. I mean, just think again about what they've been doing. They've been hoarding wealth, verse 3. They've withheld wages that are rightfully someone else's, verse 4. They've lived in opulence, luxury, and self-indulgence, verse 5. They've condemned and they've murdered the innocent, verse 6. They've just been living a life of no consequences. I can, If I can get away with it, I'm going to do it. No judgment, no repercussions. And we do that. We do that. We might not think the things we do are as grand as this or as obvious as this, but we, we definitely do it. We push boundaries. We think, I'll do this and I can get away with it. Especially people who believe in grace. Oh, especially evangelicals who think, do you know what? I'll be forgiven. We just think, well, there is no judgment, is there? I can do whatever I want and God will forgive me. (sighs) If I don't harm someone else, maybe that's how we phrase it. You know, it's okay as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Even if I'm disobedient to God, then it's fine. But that's a lie. To anyone who truly thinks like that, to anyone who truly lives like that, James says, lament. Mourn, wail, grieve, because it's not going to go well for you. How is it not going to go well for them? Well, I think there's a, there's a few different ways. Firstly, if we're chasing after those things, if we put our hope and our joy and our satisfaction, our security in those things, he says they will go. Just as he says at the end of chapter 4 to the people who are planning for tomorrow without God, your life is a mist. The things that we accumulate in this life, are just for this life. That's why he says, you know, your wealth is rotted. Moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and your silver have corroded. What good is it? They'll be weeping and wailing and mourning because those things that you pinned your, your, your joy and your satisfaction in, they won't last. And when Jesus comes back and they disappear, you'll think, oh, what was my life for? What on earth was it for? Everything that I spent my time fighting, pressing on, pushing others out of the way for, is gone. Here he's speaking very much about money, but for the rest of us, for everybody else, it needn't be money. It could be anything, couldn't it? It could be status. We spend our lives making sure that people know us and remember us. Even if people do remember us when we're gone, how long will they remember us for? I don't want to don't have a go or anything, but none of us here are destined for that much greatness where we're going to be remembered a hundred years down the line, are we? Maybe you are. Prove me wrong. That's fine. But ultimately, our names will be erased from the history books. What about people who do all they can to, to craft and create this family around them, this support around them, which are good things, good things. But how long will it last? I've said it before. Kids grow up. They move away. Relationships break down. It's sad, but it's the truth. When we put our trust in it, when we put our lives and our hope and our joy in it, when it leaves, when it inevitably fails us and fades away, there will be weeping, there will be mourning. But there's another way that that weeping and wailing will come, and that's if you're outside of Christ, 
If Christ hasn't paid the price for your sin, then this stuff will, will condemn you. This stuff will stand as witness against you that when Jesus says, what did you live for? Did you live for me? Did you live for yourself and for other things? There'll be this whole witness stand, this whole testimony of things that speak out against you, that speak out the fact that you are a rebellious person that doesn't have Jesus at the center, the way it's supposed to be. Weeping, wailing. But I think as well, I mean, he's speaking to the church. He's speaking to believers. I think even for us who believe in the forgiveness that we get through Christ, who know that, I think he's speaking about a genuine weeping and wailing. That when judgment comes, we won't be judged in that sense of condemnation or salvation. But we'll have lost our, our crown in heaven. We'll have lost that reward, not salvation. But our lives will be weighed and measured and we'll be found one thing. And Jesus said, well, what, will, what have you made with the new life that I've given you? Scripture speaks about losing that crown and, and it'll be a devastating experience. Weeping and wailing because we live our lives like we don't think Jesus is going to do anything. Of course he is. He said, he's revealed that part of his will, that he's going to come back and he's going to judge. We need to know that Jesus in charge is in charge and that he's going to, do, he's going to put right the wrongs of this age. Keeping on, moving on. Group three. Verses 11, 7 to 11. He says this. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. And how patient he is for the autumn and spring rain, rains. You too be patient and stand firm. Because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is compassion, is full of compassion and mercy. Here's what group three are saying with confidence. I don't believe he cares. First group, I don't believe he's in charge. Second group, I don't believe he's going to do anything. Third group, I don't believe he even cares. You see how each group has been marked by a certain unbelief that James has to put right, that we have to see Jesus for who he truly is, who he fully is in order to live right. I mean, that's not an uncommon statement to make, is it? If we don't like to associate ourselves with group one or group two, I think almost every single one of us in this room this morning can, can relate with that statement of unbelief of group three. I don't believe he cares. Maybe not not as assertive a statement as that, but maybe just a question. Does he care? Does he care? Because at the moment it doesn't feel like he cares. It doesn't feel like he's a gracious, compassionate God. It doesn't feel like he's a God who feeds us night and day, who gives us what we need, as we were looking at in Psalm 145. And oftentimes when we're in that group three, when we're feeling the pinch, when it feels like life is against us, the world is against us, and God doesn't care, we feel like we're the only person in the world going through that, don't we? If you're going through that now, just let me encourage you. You're not the only person in the world thinking those things. You're not even the only person here this morning thinking those things. You're not even the only person in whichever little section you're sitting in thinking those things. Does he care? Does he care? Because it's easy to forget that he is a God who does care. In spite of circumstances, in spite of suffering, he is a God who cares. So what does James say to this group then to, to, to show them their disbelief and to encourage them to right thinking and right living about Jesus? Well, he points them to three places. He points them to the farmer, he points them to the prophet, and ultimately he points them to Job. Why does he do that? Well, this picture of the farmer is a really helpful one because he's saying, do you know what? Even though the work might be hard now, what do you call it? Tilling the soil, plowing the soil, sowing the seeds, getting out the rocks and the weeds. It's hard work, it's sweaty work, it's, it's rough work, it's dirty work. He says, do you know what? You go through that because you know that a harvest is coming. He says, be patient, my brothers. The Lord is coming. Look at the farmer. He does all this work and it looks like there's no reward. Has it been worth it? Yes. Yes. Because there is a harvest. 
The one who labors long in the soil is the one who reaps the harvest. And he says, for those of you who are going through it, you know what? It is worth it because Jesus is coming back and it will be sweeter for you. It'll be sweeter for you then. How is that so? Well, he says, well, look at the prophet, but ultimately look at Job. I mean, Job is the ultimate example of suffering. Suffering without being able to see God's purpose for it. Sometimes we read the book of Job and we struggle to understand what's going on, okay? And we've been let in on what has happened in heaven before the book of Job. If you read the book of Job, you'll see there in chapters 1 and 2, I think it is, this conversation that's going on in heaven between God and the Satan. Uh, And we know that. And we still kind of don't understand. Job is oblivious to all of that. And his life is just misery upon misery upon misery. And if that isn't enough, he's got these friends who come and just do his head in. Really, just are no help, no comfort. Make his, his suffering in that misery all so much more worse. But what does he say? You've heard of Job's perseverance and you have seen what the Lord finally brought about. Well, what did the Lord finally bring about in Job's life? I think finally what he brought about in Job's life was a a deeper knowledge of him, was a deeper knowledge of his creator, a deeper knowledge of the reality that Job was a fragile man who depended on God for everything. And that God, even in the midst of that suffering, was still a God who was worth worshipping, was worth loving, was a God who would still love him. And yes, we look at the book of Job and, you know, the suffering is taken away, his health is restored, his wealth is restored, all these different things. But really, what did Job get? He got that relationship with God. He got that conversation with God. To to speak and to know him and to see that above and beyond all of these things, it was worth it. You know, who am I to say what, what God's will is in your life other than what he says in this book? But I do know that through the suffering, through the pain, through the frustrations we have in life. God will work. God will work to bring us closer to him, to bring us more into a relationship with him and to depend on him. When things are easy, we don't look to God. We don't even look to one another. We look to the things that God has given us. When things are hard, we can only look to God. And there's the fruit, isn't it? That when Jesus comes back, and he will come back, he is in charge, he will come back to judge, and you know what? He will say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And our crown will be big. I don't know whether that's a biblical thing to say. Our crown will be big, it will be glorious. For those who have persevered, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. (sighs) What's the thing that ties all of these things together then? The group that says he's not in charge. The group that says he's not going to judge. The group who says he doesn't care. Ultimately, we need to know that Jesus is still alive and that he is coming back. There's two things. He's still alive now and he is coming back. Brothers and sisters, we need to know that. Don't we need to know that in all of like circumstances, in all of our disbelief, in all of our unbelief, however we express it, whether we express it with one of these three groups or whether we've made up a new way of, of thinking about it, we can live today and tomorrow with Jesus at the center because he's alive and he is at the center. He is in charge. We should follow him. We should follow him because we know when we go our own ways, there is judgment coming and it's a horrible thing. And we should follow him even through hard times, through suffering, through pain, because he is coming back and he'll right all the wrongs and he'll heal our wounds. He will be a God who is full of compassion and a God who is full of mercy. This is what we need to know. This is what we need to to learn from James this morning is that Jesus is very much alive. He very much has a plan and he is working those plans out. Question is, is he at the center of our universe? Is he at the center of your universe? I'm going to just say, you know, if you've come to church this morning and and you've heard all these grand claims about God, that he is a good God, he's a gracious God, he's a glorious God, he's a majestic God, and you've thought to yourself, I I don't believe that. And I can't look at the world the way it is and, and see that that is true. It is true. It is true. And you need to come and recognize that. 
You need to take yourself out of the center of the universe and you need to put Jesus there. If you look around at the pain and the suffering in other people's lives or or even in your own life and you say, well, well, God isn't in control. Let me be clear. The pain and the suffering is 100% the result of us being at the center of the universe. We blame God, but we don't let him be in the driving seat. He is in the driving seat. Recognize that. The only way that we can put Jesus back into the driving seat is to bow the knee is to come through Christ and ask for forgiveness for our rebellion and accept that grace and love that he has given us in Jesus. And when we do that, we need to keep living that. That's not a a one-day thing. That's a today. That's a tomorrow. That's a next month. That's a next year. That is till the very last day of my life. Until he comes again, Jesus in charge. Jesus is in control. He's done so much for us. He's done so much for us. And all he asks... It's for us to follow him. All he asks is for us to to live life as he has planned it. All he has asked is for us to, to enjoy and to celebrate and to live out the fact that he is a God who is in charge. Let me pray and then we'll sing together. Lord God, I do thank you that we come this morning not to a dead God, not to a buried God, not even to a risen again God and an absent God, but a God who is in control, who is still at the center of the universe, ruling, ruling and reigning over all. Lord God, I thank you that as we try and unpick and explore and find your will for our lives, Lord God, there is so much of our lives that are mapped out in your word. Lord God, how we should care for one another, how we should love one another, how we should respond to you. Our attitude and our actions described in your word to us. Help us to be a people who listen. But as well, Lord God, as we think about our future plans and your will for our lives, just to see and to recognize your will for the whole world. Your will is that people would come to recognize you, would put you back at the center. Lord God, but your plan as well is that ultimately to come again, to come again and to judge. Lord God, to, to, to draw into you those who have found faith. And Lord God, I pray that many more of those would be found today and tomorrow and this month in this area or around Wales, around the world, Lord God, in all the situations we've prayed for. Lord God, we pray that as your people go out, as they declare your goodnesses, as they as they live that out, Lord God, more and more people will come into your flock, come into your fold, come into your kingdom and can look forward to that day, not as a day to be scared of, not as a day to weep and to wail, but a day to rejoice in. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.